So Felix, uh, great uh, for having us here over here at uh, the Burs van Berlage in, in Amsterdam. Yes. Uh, you're the, the founder of, of Meet Berlage. Yeah. Uh, what is it for people that don't know it? Meet Berlage is a seeds to meetcom location. Um, basically, it's a competence platform. Uh, and what that means is that we try to build a place where people uh, can connect around ideas. So we bring in as many competencies and skills as possible to make a very uh, wide or broad ecosystem. Um, and then we facilitate the matching of these competencies. And that's the most difficult part because that has to have a lot of serendipity involved. You cannot know in advance what competencies need to be matched. That's kind of a magical process, but you can stimulate that process. So we ask people that come here to be really open to meet others, uh, to share their knowledge. Uh, and that's why it doesn't cost any money to work in this location. Um, but if you find a group of people and you need some privacy, then you can just use mo one of the meeting rooms or an office space or host an event. And that's also where the business model is. Okay, so <clears throat> and you say okay, the hardest part is, is, is to make the match in competence, but I think also uh, a really hard part is to explain what it is because people they think oh it's it's a co it's it's a co-working space, yeah. but as you explain it's, it's it's much more than that. Yeah. And uh, last week when I was at camping, I, I read an article of you about the decentralized ownerships of of, of organizations. So today we're going to talk about two things. First, about how you how you as an entrepreneur. <coughs> are thinking about new and also implementing new ways of ownership in your own organization and then about your piece about decentralized organizations. So yes. because you're all you're really somebody who all, yeah, uh, who's also really uh, practicing what you preach. Uh, yep. So you also are experimenting in Meet Berlage, that's your company, uh, in okay how can we involve uh, 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 the people who are working uh, with me for me uh, in ownership in the company. So di uh, how did it start? Um. It started um, when I started to build my own companies and I started with my first organization when I was 19 um, and I've always been thinking about how do you make the transformation from one entrepreneur to a big group of people because if you want to build a big organization you will need a lot of people to help you do that. And most of the time you need a lot of people who are way smarter than the initial entrepreneur with, with the first ID. And one of the biggest challenges that, that always comes forward um, uh, when a business is starting to be built is that the entrepreneur is extremely driven, works 18 hours a day and just builds and builds and builds. And then at some point he has to start hiring people who just aren't that motivated as the entrepreneur. They might be extremely motivated but the older and the more rigid the company gets, the less motivation you'll find within the people. Yeah, or, 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 or different motivations. Different motivation, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But you want, I, I'm, I always um, try to look for that entrepreneurial motivation because that drive for me is extremely strong and I wanna give it to other people that I work with as well. Um, there's not really a way to give it, but there's, I think there's a way to create a setting where people uh, live it themselves, where people are invited to work from that drive. Um, and that has a lot to do with shared ownership, because I think a big driver for me um, is the, the ownership in the ID, and that's not in the shareholding side of it, but it's more of, um, psychological ownership like we're building this space we're very proud of what we're building and it's just very cool to be attached to um, building this this these type of innovations yeah so that's, that's, that's completely new uh, when you look at, at different organizations we see now growing uh, many, or many organizations like Airbnb yeah. they're doing <coughs> from the outside really new stuff uh, especially when you compare it to the existing organizations but when you look at uh, the organization and the ownership it's still as old as the way to Rome. It's really, yeah, it's really old-fashioned. And 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 uh, and what way do you bring this to practice uh, with uh, with Meet Berlage? Um, we are looking at Holacracy right now, which is a kind of an operating system for an organization, uh, and it allows people to it, it allows a lot of organizations to work without a big hierarchy, without uh, a lot of bosses. Um, people are enabled to work 
from a very autonomous uh, point of view, so they can do whatever they want as long as they have enough advice to do it. Uh, we're just getting into this for the past couple of weeks. Uh, there's a, a really cool coach who's helping uh, us with that as well. Um, and mainly that came from the idea where even a big corporate, you know, if there's uh, 80,000 people working for a big corporate, still they're just people that um, are collaborating around this big vision that they should have. Yeah. A lot, of, yeah, a lot of time this is missing, but still there are a lot of uh, corporates who have a, a strong vision. But maybe 1% maybe of the organization actually knows and lives that vision, and the rest is just working, working, working. So I get why we built these traditional structures, why we built these chain structures, these big organizations with big hierarchies, because there was no other way to do it to control this big group of people to make sure that everything worked out as planned in the vision. But I think that's going to change because we have so many new tools and so many new insights on how people work, how we get more, um, yeah, basically this sounds really crude, but how we get more out of people. You know, we don't want them to do one thing repeatedly every day, uh, 200 times in a factory anymore, but we want people to really explore um, the most they can uh, give to the, to the society, the, the most energy they can give to the society and the most innovation they can put in an organization. Um, so we'll need different structures, I think, for that. Instead of controlling people, really enabling them, but really enabling them. Because what's happening now is that a lot of organizations are trying to flip their pyramid and, and they say, we're just going to support you in your growth. But still, if you want to make a decision, you need to go by via your manager. So they're kind of free, but they're not completely free. Yeah. And, and really, um, that's why we're lucky here, because we started two years ago. We have a, a clean slate. So we can really start from the beginning with, um, without being influenced by these traditional ways of organizing that really hold hold back a lot of innovation. That sounds, that sounds really interesting, but how do you do this in practice? Uh, because, because many people have a vision about how we should work in the future, about yeah, yeah. The ownership, but you're already doing this in practice. So, yeah. so how, how do you do it in practice and what are the challenges you face by implementing it? We were inspired by platforms like Quirky and Assembly. Uh, and these were really places where people could uh, come by with an ID. Uh, hundreds of people could uh, work for that ID. And then, in the beginning, the idea was, for example, 10,000 coins worth. If you would build the website, you would get 500 coins. If you would build the framework, that, that would be like 10, 000, uh, 100 tasks, uh, objectives, mm -hmm. and you would get 100 coins per objective. So the 10,000 coins would be split up uh, with all, under all the people that worked to achieve the, the purpose of the project. Then if the project was launched and it started to generate revenues and profits, the profit is shared according to the, the coins that are given away. So this entrepreneur, he didn't have to go to the bank. He just created these coins, handed them out to people who had the time and energy to invest in that organization. And then everybody starts to do a revenue share. So, so then you build your company with a, 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 a virtual or, or a uh, alternative coin? We didn't, and, and, we, we and didn't implement a, a coin yet. That okay, would be uh, really uh, interesting. But with, uh, with assembly, with, yeah. With, uh, with examples. Yeah. Uh, and then in the end, when the physical money came into the organization, it was divided uh, yeah. uh, 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 into, okay, uh, how many coins? Is, uh, like, uh, like, say, we, uh, we get one of the coins, yeah. there's $100 or, or euro coming in. <coughs> I have two coins, then I get two, so two dollars. Two dollars, yeah. yeah. It's very, very simple. Yeah, and cool. and it, this, this would be impossible in, in, uh, in the past. Uh, you know, in the past, the, the traditional way was uh, the entrepreneur would go to the bank, hire people to achieve the point of going to market. But, but uh, why isn't it possible in the past? Because in the end, okay, uh, now we're going to do it uh, probably uh, digital, yeah. and, 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 and it's better to, 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 uh, to uh, do the project and 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 that the project fails and 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 really uh, to see what's happening, but in the end, so it's 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 easier now. It, yeah. It's it's better to do. But in the end, you you could also do it with a small group and just uh, give them papers uh, with uh, with coins. Yeah, true, very true. And that's what happened a lot in the in the past, where three or four entrepreneurs would work <laughs> for two years without getting paid. 
um, and then they would have the luck of finding the right competencies within a group of friends, for example. Now you have access to all the competencies all over the planet, so you can start a, a swarm of people of like a thousand people in a week, and with a thousand people, you'll be done in a couple of weeks if you structure and organize it right, oh. uh, in, in a very fluid way that the work gets done in, in the right way, etc. Um, so that's that's why I think it would. In the past, it, it has been done with the small groups of people who have just given up their, their lives to do that and going for that big amount of risk. But now, uh, when I'm on one of those platforms, I just, you know, I'll create a website for one project. I'll get a very small share in the project. Um, but that's what I do. And a thousand other people do their thing and will be live in half a year. Yeah, so but, uh, but then that, 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 that trust is really important because uh, like when you are busy on such a website, uh, they contribute to let's say ten different uh, uh, organizations. Yeah. But in the end, when you get uh, no money out of it at all, yeah. uh, then you also have a, a, a problem for yourself because you have to pay your rent. So, so at what yeah. way are there are they building uh, a trust? Well, Assembly did that, um, and this was their bottleneck uh, when a company would be uh, ready to go to market then they would bring it to the market. So they would actually exploit the company when it was done. Uh, and this was a bottleneck because they couldn't run all those companies and then do all the revenue share, uh, etc. So this is one of the biggest issues uh, that's, that's going to have to be solved. I think a lot of transparency will help. Um, and also a lot of reputation management because if you pull a trick like that once where you have a company built by 10,000 people and then you take it away and you, you start operating somewhere else and, and don't share your, uh, your profits as promised, you'll do that once in your life yeah. and then you won't, get a, uh, you won't get into any other swarm or mesh or community or whatever. Just, yeah. This is going to be attached to your name forever. Yeah, but in the end there, there will be always more contributors uh, than project owners. And we're looking to balance about, okay, how many, uh, when you are contributing to a project, how many times a project can screw up before you say, okay, now I'm done with it and, and, I, and I don't trust it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, remember, you're looking for the balance between how, how, how you can build, because when you're looking, talking about reputation building, uh, you have to start somewhere. And are there, all, are there also techniques where they are uh, <coughs> uh, giving entrepreneurs who want to start su such a new project are already giving reputation uh, from other platforms like with uh, no. reputation from... No, that's a good point. We're actually we're looking at that um, for the Dutch sharing economy uh, within uh, from Sitsumit. This, uh, this originated this idea where there are so many uh, sharing economy platforms, for example, they're all building their service platforms for that same guest uh, or that same customer. Um, but uh, we could do a lot of, we could make a lot of combinations in reputation management. You know, if mm. there's a, a challenge there, because if someone is a good driver, I don't know if he's a good co-worker or mm -hmm. whatever, but there should be, the, it, you can match reputation management and there's a couple of platforms trying to do that already and there's no winner yet, but um, yeah. yeah, and that's, a, that's, I don't know, that's something for the future, but I think, um, or for the near future, I think one of the main, one of the really interesting points is that to do this you have to build in a lot of transparency in the group that you're working with. Um, and this transparency allows for social control mechanism, mechanisms that we've pretty much taken out of a lot of organizations. Uh, because a lot of core teams or owners or directors of organizations didn't want that, many, that much transparency um, for pretty obvious reasons. Because it's very, it's very difficult to become greedy if there is a social controlling mechanism in, mechanism in an organization. But people, especially if an organization is going to grow, there's something inside people that makes you greedy. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to stop, except for that social controlling mechanism. And if you add a lot of transparency into the organization, then all the people that work within that organization, um, they can actually control that greed. They can say, this is not fair, this is not right, this doesn't feel right. But are the people then also 
uh, capable uh, of of seeing the bigger picture. Uh, because uh, when you talk uh, uh, like with the bonuses, <coughs> then you say, okay, they're bad, but maybe then your decision about that is on short term. Uh, maybe on long term, it was a good decision. So, so at, at what way then? Uh, because okay, it, it's really important to have a, a, a clear vision. Mm. But at what way do you uh, the, the same? Because I don't really believe in extreme si situations. Same like democracy, if everybody could vote for everything, if the, the uh, uh, would, uh, would be a mess. Yeah. The same with, uh, with tra uh, transparency. Also in the book of of, of, of David Eggert, uh, the, the Circle. Uh, there are always good stories to tell about, okay, let's make everything transparent, yeah. but in the end that, all, that uh, isn't also going to work. So, um, in what way are you then going to make the balance between uh, long and short term? Uh, because I think many people are, 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 are really thinking and, and, and acting really on short term, and also yeah. when they also get more in, in control of the organization, then there's also a risk that the organization will be more in short term, like decisions to make, okay, in short term we can make, uh, let's say, uh, 1,000 euro profit for every, for every employee, a uh, good 1,000 euro, but the decision may also be a really bad decision for the long term. Yeah, it's a very difficult question because we don't know, um, but we need to figure out a way to figure this out and to make a, a kind of a safe haven to figure this out. Yeah. You know, um, I think that's that's the main issue, and that's what's resonating with a lot of uh, bigger co organizations that I uh, run into. Um, in our in in this co-working world with uh, with all the nomads, etc., there's a very interesting group that's called Permanent Beta, and they see the world as a permanent beta. You know, nothing is finished ever, um, and it's okay to fail. Uh, because it helps you reach uh, your goal and your goal is going to change anyway so you should never make an assumption of how something is going to be and then work yourself to death to get there uh, because everything is always in evolution um, if these organizations create a safe haven for this to happen and also for them to fail I mean that's the same with our our company what we do in Meet Berlage now is that at the end of the month, if we make a profit, then it's being shared amongst the people that, that work here. We've changed that model in the past couple of months. We've, we've been changing small things because they just didn't work, assumptions that didn't work. So uh, which, which assumptions didn't work? For example, we, we said we're going to um, set a percentage of that, that profit for everybody who works here, and then there's a limit for everybody who who works here because um, we want to reserve also something in the organization so that after after a quarter or after a year we can all decide that we have a reserve now and we can reinvest in the organization by training or in building or whatever but if for example these two uh, variables like the percentage per person and the maximum per person they just wouldn't work they wouldn't add up and I couldn't have figured it out in advance because my math skills aren't that big. Um, so we, you know, after three months we, we noticed this and it changed. Um, also, we're very much trying to get into the psychology behind it. Um, because the end, the, the end game uh, that I'm looking for is that everybody feels like uh, they have ownership over the organization and that's the most important thing but money isn't a really big driver in that for some people it is um, but it's not the best driver so I really like the idea that we've limited that that there's no uh, endless amounts of money to be made if we push on sales and short-term um, gaining um, but you know, it's it's we're we're just talking about this a lot. Like, what would help you create more of a sense of ownership over this organization? Or in this specific case, uh, you know, I missed the the sense of ownership. Why why didn't you pick up this project? Um, um, and why didn't you do every? Why didn't you give it a hundred percent to make this project work? We just tried to get into that and try to find the way for every individual to create the space or the environment where they they can just operate from their own um, 
autonomous and, and um, secure position. Yeah. yeah, because when you look at, at, at motivations, uh, doesn't it something make people nervous? Because they are, uh, you, you are really driven because it, uh, this, this place is your baby. You started this with a vision and, and now two years later it, it's, it's really growing. Yeah. Um, but there are also people maybe with different motivations say, okay, I want to work here maybe for two years and uh, to, uh, to get some experience yep. and then do other things. So yep. this kind of people don't they get really nervous of, 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 of because you're always yeah, uh, 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 you're really expecting some things of them they maybe don't want to do f uh, when you look at uh, their personal motivation. Yeah, yeah this is a very uh, a big duality because I feel like um, the role of an entrepreneur uh, should be really to to create a safe place where people can can really grow and they can they can put their energy in a project and and make it work um, and if they are scared that there is not enough money to be to to come in or the project is going to fail um, then they start to be th then they start to work from the the wrong drivers really from a fear basis also. I don't think it's a it's a great model where all this fear then ends up with the entrepreneur, and he hides it from the rest of the group. So I'm, I haven't worked that out yet. That's, yeah. that's a very difficult point because yeah. I it's it's very important for the organization to always make sure that everybody can work from a standpoint of abundance, like they have enough income or they have enough time or they have enough energy and. We focus on that very clearly. I know this from everybody who works here, and we try to um, make it safe enough, make the environment safe enough that if people don't have enough abundance, then they can uh, uh, say that. Um, but yeah, the organization organization might fail. You know, you never know what's going to happen, or there might not be enough money that that's coming in. Oh. Uh, we've just had or we in the middle of the summer months and our business model is really the exploitation of the meeting spaces here but in the summer everybody's on a holiday and nobody's going to have meetings so we opened that up at the beginning of the year like guys uh, July and August are going to be very slow months we're probably not going to make a profit then what are we going to do and that was a very interesting exercise because normally I would think of that as the entrepreneur. Uh, I would make sure that there was a reserve or that I would go to the bank for a loan or whatever. And now we just opened it up with the whole group. And we, did, we, were, we didn't, the group didn't become scared about it. We just said, okay, this is something we have to solve together. Uh, and we found a solution together. And that, that, it was just great because I could figure out the solution, but now we had six people who were very motivated to find a great solution. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And and and, and is is uh, uh, because there are now working seven people over here. To, to uh, six, six, six people. Yeah. So it's uh, quite small. This, this yeah, makes it easy to test. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's really good. And and um, is their com uh, their complete salary depends on 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 on, on uh, the, the 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 profit of of, of the month or, or is it uh, be because maybe it's also really interesting because we're talking yeah. in the Netherlands uh, or, or also outside the Netherlands uh, also a, a lot about basic income. Is there also a basic salary that people have or is it completely uh, depends on the profits you make in the month? Well, that's where it gets really interesting um, because half of the group is uh, self-employed. So they can invoice from their own company, and half of the group um, just has one employer, which is us. So you cannot become self-employed in that case, uh, and you have to have a labor agreement, um, which I think is great. But there is a, a minimum wage involved, so they always have a basic income. And it's kind of unfair to the self-employed people, because they don't always have a basic income. So we made the agreement that everybody has a, a basic income here. And that also brings forward, um, you know, a point of rest, uh, like mm -hmm. a, a point of rest. This is not the great, not, no, not the best uh, English, but you know, it eases course. people yeah. and, and it just gives you the confidence. Like, okay, there's at least there's going to be enough money that comes in to, to live um, for me. Yeah. And do you, do you think this really is is one of the key factors of success of these kind of models that people? Are because uh, there was also a, a, a nice article in, in, in Correspondence, a, a Dutch online newspaper, about mm. 
why poor people make uh, stupid de uh, yeah, yeah, decisions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also because when you're poor or when you don't have the <coughs> the, 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 the feeling, okay, I'm, I, I'm going to have enough money to pay the rent this month, they're uh, really on short term and, and, and making the wrong decisions. So yeah. uh, do you think this, this, this basic income, a minimal wage, I think the, the, min the minimum wage is, qu is quite high for a basic in uh, income, maybe? Or maybe yeah, not. it's okay here. Um, yeah. Do you think that's one of the key ingre uh, ingredients of such models to, to be successful? I think the key ingredient is... Uh, there, there, we have four key ingredients if you want to come work here. You have to share our big vision. You have to share that or you want to build on that big vision from your intrinsic motivation. Uh, because that's your personal driver. Um, we need to connect. There just needs to be a chemistry. Uh, and you need to have abundance. And that can be anything. So whether you're unemployed and you're sitting at home and you have nothing to do and you just want to help build this place. We did that with one guy. Um, and then the thing is he could only work here one day a week, of course, because uh, if you start working here four days a week, uh, the the... The um, government won't allow this, which I understand. But he worked here for, I think, a month and a half, and we started to connect him within the ecosystem. And then now, a month and a half later, he had two um, uh, jobs. So he's, he's working full time now. Yeah. So he found the right way from a different point of abundance. You know, or the organization needs to have abundance, so we need to make uh, quite a profit to hire someone new to be able to pay them as well. Um, but this is crucial. If you don't have abundance, then people are starting to live in fear. And fear-based decisions are very different than abundance-based decisions. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, that's, also, that's really the basis of that article, that people just make really dumb short-term decisions. Um, based on fear. Yeah. And, and what about because uh, when, you, when you look at, at organizations, uh, the cleaner uh, is, 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 is getting an income, but also the, 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 the director gets probably one other times more money mm. uh, than the cleaner. Um, and what do, uh, does everybody uh, um, get the same amount of money from the, from the, from the, 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 the profit that, that has been made? Uh, here, no. No, and um, that's a very difficult point because we just, we basically just set that amount in the beginning, or I did, um, based on assumptions. Uh, and we're starting to talk about that now. Um, we've, pretty, we've pretty much leveled it out uh, that everybody is making the same uh, amount of money because everybody does everything here. Mm -hmm. So there's no difference between a cleaner or between, you know, uh, between a salesperson because they do the same thing um, and it's that's quite easy in this organization I know there's some organizations who say everybody makes the same amount and there's even one who says you make the same amount and you can only work here three years which keeps innovation going in the, in the organization and the change of competencies that's that's very much needed in most businesses um, there are a lot of models that are being tested. I really like the, the, the model where everybody earns the same money because there cannot be a friction in those organizations about something as stupid as uh, the income of someone. And I basically feel that, that no one should really care about that. You know, If you can live um, in abundance, then you should be happy. Um, and you've done well for yourself. And then you can focus on the important stuff in life. Yeah. Uh, I can understand that people would want to make more than uh, than the abundance that they already make in most organizations. I just think it's a really bad driver if that's it's if that's your goal. It should really be a means, and for most people, it's becoming a goal. Yeah. It makes you miserable because it's a goal that's very hard to reach. If you reach it, you become more miserable because. Like with most goals, you know, the path towards it is, is the interesting part of it. Um, and uh, it's a very double goal as well, because if you want to make that, that bigger amount of money, you need to work harder for most people. At least that's in the mindset for, mo mm -hmm. for most people. Or so make, uh, work harder or make more bad short-term uh, decisions.
Yeah, and then ruin your organization in the long term. So it's very dangerous because, uh, well, in, in the case of working harder, then you have more money in your bank account, but all the stuff that you really wanted to do in your life, you're unable to do because you're now, sub, you know, you're stuck in this whole web of working really hard to make that amount of money. And it's a very bad exercise if you think it out. Um, and yet, of course, if you start to make short-term gains in an organization, often this, um, this doesn't really add up to the long-term vision of the, or the purpose of the organization. And that's what you see with a lot of really cool startups. They have a really big vision, they start, um, they get uh, funding or, or maybe not. They are not making their projected uh, amounts, their incomes because you always over project if you start an organization everybody always does they really they think too much is going to come in and then they start to open up new ways of making money you know or maybe we could do this to make some extra money or maybe we could do that to make some extra money and before you know it they have like 10 income streams and after two years they've kind of lost their purpose and they're so much stuck in these short-term income streams yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but but also that, and, and uh, I really I, I really recognize they are really entrepreneurs now building great things started from uh, from a big vision. Yeah. And same like same like I interviewed uh, the day recommend the founder of, of Indiegogo. Uh, her parents were entrepreneurs. They couldn't get a loan uh, off the bank, so they yeah, needed yeah. that extra capital, and that made that they couldn't grow with the company, and that was their problem for all their life. <clears throat> and then her dream is uh, to democratize the, uh, the extra capital. But so, so she's clear uh, an entrepreneur, a leader with a big vision, but the company is funded with venture capital money and they want to have a profit in, in five years, uh, maybe uh, 10 times the amount of money they put in the company because yeah. they're investing in, in, in many other companies and only a couple of companies are successful. So they also really have to make this profits on this one company that's, that's really is successful. Yeah. So I'm really curious about, let's say, the next five years, what will happen with the vision of her in the company <coughs> when also, uh, did you read a book of, of the story behind Twitter? No, no. Right, it's, it's, it's a really nasty story. And we, if, if you really want to see a really interesting example of, of people being screwed mm -hmm. because of short term, uh, 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 um, uh, things about short-term uh, uh, yeah. uh, making profits uh, uh, and ownership. I think that's a really interesting uh, book to, to to read. But in the end, uh, when you uh, uh, look at your own or or organization, meet Berlag, so people there are are are, are sharing <coughs> the, the, the 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 revenue of the company. They uh, they got a basic income, so they don't have to worry about okay, can I pay my rent? So I think that that's a really important thing, yep. uh, part of the story. But um, they don't uh, uh, get uh, shares of the company, don't no. they? So no. in the end, uh, the, uh, we're all creating failure together. In the end, on short term, everybody is yeah. making more profit uh, when, it, uh, when the business goes well. But in the long term, looking to the ownership, yep. uh, you're the one who's making your profit. Well, there's two reasons why I didn't do that. First of all, because we're experimenting and I'm scared as hell to give away my company. Um, no, uh, it's yeah, going yeah, yeah. to happen at some time, <coughs> at some point. But uh, also, um, and I'm talking to a lot of people about this, the, the, legally it's quite difficult, you know, if you're looking at a, a swarm of people, if you, if you would expand this idea and you would build an organization with 10,000 people and you want to incorporate a dynamic ownership, really ownership of shares, it's impossible. It's virtually, it's so expensive first of all to do it. And then it's almost impossible to do it. But I really feel that there's two values in ownership of shares of an organization. And one really big downside as well. Uh, two values. There's first the value of uh, profit share, so dividends, uh, which might be you know, less taxable. So it might be more interesting to, to share the profits in, in that way, in a dividend. But right now we just chose to share the, the profits. Uh, so basically we're achieving the same goal there uh, and second of all in the case of an exit that's in, that's when it's interesting to have a share when you're selling the organization it's same like with the, the Turkish version of 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 uh, of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, he made a profit of 124 million and he said okay I'm going to share it with people in my company and everybody who did 
a bigger contribution gets also a bigger part of the share. I'm, I'm really interested about how he's going to do it, yeah. uh, but, but uh, that's one example so that, of that. That's, you know, that's a difficult part because if we would ever sell this space, and I could not imagine it, but I never say never, if we would ever sell it, of course, everybody who's built this, you know, they should have equal rights in the amount that we uh, sell it for. And we're going to have to figure that out with the whole group. Um, but it's just really, <laughs> in, my, in my heart, it's impossible to sell it and then put all the money in my bank account. It's just, there's, there's no way to, to do that. And I can <coughs> secure that and protect that by giving them actual shares. But the thing is, this is a company I want to build for 15 to 20 years. So what's going to happen after two years is if someone's going to go to another project. And this is where my fears uh, originate from right now. But we're going to figure that out as well. Um, I really feel that we need, and this is why I liked Assembly, because they would exploit the company themselves. So there would be no hassle about the actual ownership of shares in the organization. We really need to fi figure out how to do this legally. Because if you really want to build a swarm with shared ownership with 100,000 people, you know, how are you going to do it legally um, to really make it, uh, make it right? Yeah, so, so the, the part of giving people a part of the profits, uh, it's quite doable. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, easy. Easy. That's, um, that's quite easy. But the part of, okay, we're going to make everybody uh, owner of the company. And also, because the, also the example you gave uh, where, uh, uh, with the virtual coins. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> they can represent ownership. Yeah. But uh, apparently it's incredibly difficult. Uh, first of all, what I understand in Holland, you cannot do crowdfunding, for example, um, and really give away a share. It, it has to be in the form of a loan. I know there are some examples where these loans have been converted to shares. I do not want to know what the expenses for lawyers and accountants no, and the, the uh, there are. Uh, there are two versions, you got uh, like Sibit. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, uh, 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 they, uh, they do equity based crowdfunding. Uh, 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 and what they say, okay, like say, in, in, uh, because I also use it for my uh, for, for a book. Oh, yeah. So I yeah. said, okay, I sold 20% of the shares of my book for 20,000 euros. So the validation of my book was 1,000 euros, which was crazy, but okay, that is uh, one of my really expensive lessons in life. Um, and then all the uh, 171 investors, uh, uh, people who put together 20,000 euro, they came together in the corporations and the corporations bought uh, with one voice 20% uh, of the shares yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Brand Vision book uh, 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 BV. Yeah. Uh, that's the, 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 the version of, of, of Simbit, the, the version like one per crowds, crowd, uh, but also another platform which name I forgot in Netherlands, but there are many platforms who deal in the convertibles. They say, okay, uh, then it starts with a loan. And at the moment, the first big investors uh, came in. Uh, and and, you, can also, and they, they, you can also say, okay, then the first investors it, yeah. that <coughs> invest at least 1,000 euro or amount of X. Uh, and then you can convert uh, uh, with a, uh, a discount uh, uh, because then you also uh, get the benefits of uh, the, the, the skills of the investor. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, because in the end, like with uh, Simbits, then you have no idea uh, if the validation is right. But when you make combinations with the uh, professional investor, yeah. because most, most people who are investing in crowdfunding are not professional investors, then you also uh, can get advantage of the skills of the investor. But then the investor got the advantage of the knowledge of the crowds. And, there's other, and the third one is it's, uh, my micro invest, it's in Belgium. And they say, okay, let's say you want to uh, have uh, 500,000 euro. Okay, then in, in, in one project, we're going to get 400,000 euro with, with, with our investors, our personal investors, and 100,000 euro uh, by using the crowds. Yeah. So in, 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 in one project, you have investors and the crowds, yeah. and, and then you have the, 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 the knowledge of the investors and also the power of the crowds in one project. So that are the difference. Uh, but well, then it's, it's also great <coughs> that there are legal structures <coughs> that actually work um, in, the, in those cases. That's yeah, the, 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 really important. the structure is, 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 is uh, with Simbit a, 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 a corporation. Yeah. Uh, and with the One Planet Crowd, it's a it Dutch, it's a stuck sitting at the Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, with corporations, they, they got more, more uh, to say. But it's also not a perfect model because I also invest in quite some projects on Simbits. And 
there are quite some uh, entrepreneurs, uh, me, uh, myself too, who, who are really struggling about, okay, how am I going to give attention to all the investors, maybe five years later after the crowdfunding yeah, campaign. That's going to be a job in itself. And also when you want to change something, like Equidam, uh, 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 it's also uh, funded by, 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 by a CMS crowdfunding campaign. For every decision, they have to have, uh, 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 ask the whole crowd, everybody, okay, do you want to do it, yes or no? And they got a quite a small crowd, so they're really lucky. But with me, we have 171 investors, but, but also like with other crowdfunding campaigns with over a thousand investors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good luck. Well, that's really, that's really the, the issue, you know. If you have a big group, how are you going to organize it? And, and now legally, uh, sometimes you get stuck because you have to ask, you have to actually legally ask the whole group. That's going to make it impossible to move as quick as we need to move now. You know, innovation is, everything is at the brink of innovation. Every organization is at the brink of innovation. Everybody is figuring out new stuff tomorrow. And, and you know, it's really easy to get a group of like 100 people around an ID and just go and work it out. And six weeks later, you might have an international organization. But if you then have to wait four weeks for everybody in the organization to respond, like yes or no, or no, no comment, yeah, it's really going to delay the organization. So. Yeah, and uh, maybe we can learn something off, off the model of Eckhart Winston. Uh, oh, definitely. Yet, yeah. uh, the cell model where you say, okay, um, uh, you can work with a uh, maximum of 70 people uh, in a company. So when uh, employee 71 comes in the company, then we're then we going to split it. Yep. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, say, okay, uh, you're now the, 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 the director of the new cell. Uh, go find your office. Yep. and do your thing but and, and and then and that's also because you also wrote a book about it uh, it's only in dutch it's not in english uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I know they, yeah that's another story <laughs> um but people who are reading this story they say okay yes we're going to empower our, our people and give them the freedom but they are forgetting that uh, people they had the freedom but there was a was border hard. and if you cross the border oh, yeah, definitely. He, he would kick you really hard back so no, there was a, there was a strong hierarchy but he yeah. made it work and that's this is why i find I, I read the book and about two weeks later i got into uh um uh, holacracy really uh, like i started with semler then i went to wienze and then i ended up with uh, holacracy and they really worked out the model of how to still have kind of kind of a small hierarchy um but really make an autonomous self-steering organization you know people can just make a decision on their own and they can get advice from their colleagues but they can never be instructed by someone and they kind of flip it all over like everybody is their own boss and, and uh, there's no consensus building which is, we're very good in in the netherlands but it takes way too long it's very difficult and it's just draining and exhausting and there's no much added, not much added value to it because if you put down if you if you have a group of six people make a decision on something and you're going to do it on building a consensus you have to take in, into account everybody's wishes you're never going to come up with the best idea no. it's it's just not going to happen so if you allow the everybody in the organization to make autonomous organization uh, decisions uh, and they, they are self steering you just need to have the faith that people are actually intelligent enough to do that. Yeah. Uh, I think in my organization people are, or in our organization people are. Uh, I, can, I can imagine that some organization might be difficult. Um, but then again, I, don't, I couldn't imagine what organization. Yeah. And, 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 and now you're, uh, you're mentioned, uh, you're, you're now here working together with six people. Yeah. So that's, that's quite a small organization. What do you think are your main challenges when you will scale up to, let's say, 500 people in, in a couple of years? If you wanted, to, that's another question, but let's say, okay, if you want to make a step to a bigger organization, what are the main challenges uh, do you think right now that will appear then? Well, in our business, uh, you know, with uh, online businesses are scalable. So you can have uh, an X amount of customers and it's just scalable. With us, we have a limited amount of space, so we need to find more space, and we're working on that very hard. Um, if I really would want to grow the, the organization to a bigger organization, um, the challenge is really finding the right operating system for that big organization. Um, because 
what you don't want to do is build a big overhead, you know, with a lot of management and a lot of controlling. But you uh, you do want to create a vision, a vision directed organization where everybody is aware of that vision. Um, and I think in most a cell structure like Eckhart built would be the perfect way, and that's exactly what Holacracy does. The thing is, Eckhart Wiense and um, uh, Semler, they go into quite some detail of the organizations. Holacracy really says, this is it, you know, this is how you do it. Like, uh, just a set of instructions of how you do it. So that's why I love it, because mm. they're the first in really giving that set of instructions. Uh, I guess every circle, if you have 500 companies, you have uh, 50 groups of 10 people. Every circle of 10 people should have one person um, who's responsible for uh, making sure that everything is uh, getoetst, uh, controlled, mm -hmm. not controlled, um, tested if it fits the vision. Yeah. And if not, they should open a discussion. Yeah, um, yeah, but then we back again, and then the vision has to be really clear oh yeah. for everybody in the organization. So yeah, so but they, uh, that's, that's why the first that's thing. That's the interesting you. thing. And now we see that with Seeds to Meet, because Seeds to Meet International is three people. That's the, that's the headquarters, you know? But we are in six countries, 70 locations, somewhere around that. Uh, so it's a really, really big organization. But it's not an organization, uh, as in it's not one business. You know, there's just a lot of groups of people doing their own thing within the organization. Fire alarm oh. test. Um, so, how do you make sure that the vision is there, that all these groups uh, just operate them by themselves? But the interesting thing is now that I kind of see that there is a switch because all of these small cells, they're changing their vision. And if they change their vision, they tell the other cells or they tell the, the headquarters cell. Uh, and that's where I think at, at, at HQ, that's where everything is, um, all the information goes to and they really aggregate all this information into updates of the vision. And, and maybe the vision goes there or maybe it goes there. It's fed by all these all these organizations that build the whole Seeds to Meet ecosystem. So it's not one vision that's being directed, um, but it's one big vision that's just being aggregated. Yeah, and that also makes it a really more a, a really shared vision. It yeah. makes it for people also uh, yeah. much, much better and easier to accept. But yeah, the big challenge is how are we going to keep that vision very clear? Yeah. And that's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Okay, and for, uh, what I think is we, because we're now uh, running uh, almost two to an hour of interview, so uh, if you're still watching, uh, thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, but I think it's really interesting that you're uh, the, the, uh, one of my favorite payoffs of brands uh, uh, is the brand of North Face, never stop exploring. I think that's what, what you're really doing, and what I really like about it, you say, okay, uh, uh, I may be a bit scared in, 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 in sharing my shares. But in the end, uh, you really are experimenting with with with, with your organization. That's also, uh, and, and also with that, also uh, uh, well with your money and your own future. So yeah. I think that's really interesting. And also, um, I'm really interested in in, in in following the process of of, of, of your experiments uh, because, like, say your your uh, your permanent beta also with your organization. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's that's really really cool. And 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 looking to you uh, as yourself as a leader um, or as an entrepreneur of this, uh, how you want to say it, uh, what drives you? Uh, what, uh, what makes you to constantly try to, 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 to experiment, to change, to, 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 to do things, to share? Uh, I think there's two motivations. For me, the main motivation is when I was younger, a lot of people told me, um, you're just going to work your ass off and uh, maybe 10 or 20 percent of your job is going to be a lot of fun. It's life, you know, accept it. And this was something I could never accept. So what, what Seeds to Meet uh, enables me to do is to build an environment where people can actually, where it's really easy for people to find their path in life. And often when you find that path, you become very happy in what you do. And work doesn't feel like work anymore, but it really feels like fulfilling your purpose in life. There's just an incredibly high amount of people in these kind of environments that live that way uh, and still make enough money to, to live. 
Um, so I want to, that's my, that's my personal intrinsic motivation to really build spaces where people can just become happier in, in, and find their purpose in, in life because it makes me happy as well and, and we just miss a lot of that. I think 80, maybe more than 80% of the people who are in the, in the workforce worldwide are just not happy and it, that's ridiculous. I just cannot understand why that's uh, true. And uh, regarding the innovation, uh, first of all because uh, we really need to. We really need to get rid of these old structures and systems that are too slow because we need to innovate to a point where we stop ripping, um, stop just ripping all the um, assets out of the planet and turning them into value, uh, but making something more sustainable maybe. Um, and also because I just, I don't know, it's, it's what keeps me up at night uh, from a positive one, point of view. And if someone, something keeps me up at night, uh, then that's my personal calling card or my signal, like I should be doing that. Okay, cool. So, uh, so I wish you lots of short nights where you wake up with <laughs> yeah. ideas and uh, thanks for the interview. Thanks, great.